So good afternoon. How good do you want your requirements to be when they are created or when they mature and are being verified? How can we ensure that we have high quality, verifiable requirements <coughs> from the beginning? So in this short presentation, I'm gonna explain how to use the system architecture model to populate and analyze structured requirements to help ensure high quality, verifiable requirements from the beginning. Let me begin with a story of two shalls. Shall is and shall be. Shall be was a requirement, at least that's what her parent told her. But she wasn't sure. She felt incomplete. She had normal teenage anxiety. She had an identity problem. She wasn't sure who she was. She didn't know what she was supposed to do. She couldn't observe her function. She didn't know what, how well she was supposed to perform the function that she couldn't observe. And she didn't know when she was supposed to do it or what should trigger it. She was very confused. <laughs> Shelby asked her parent about this, but her parent, since he was just like her, didn't think there was anything wrong. You've got a shall, he said. That's all that matters. <laughs> he didn't know that what to do about the problem because he was just like her. He was also incomplete. He had some of the same problems she had. He couldn't see his function didn't know how well he was supposed to perform it, and didn't know when he was supposed to perform it. Shalby noticed that her friend Shal is was different. She was self-confident. She knew who she was, she could observe and measure her function, and she knew when she was supposed to do it. Shalby asked Shal is why she was different. Shal is told her that her parent had been sent to MC to be analyzed. There he was analyzed, decomposed, allocated, and then measured. Shelby was puzzled because she knew that her parent had been allocated, but never analyzed or decomposed. It sounded scary. Decomposed, she asked. That sounds horrible. She also didn't want to be analyzed. After all, she was a private kind of requirement. And being analyzed and decomposed also sounded like a waste of time. But Shell has told her that when she grew up, she would be verifiable <laughs> and validated. Shelby wasn't sure whether sh she was verifiable or validated. How was she supposed to know if she was correct and complete? And after all, she had plenty of time to be revised while she was being implemented. <laughs> she could always change to match the design so that she would eventually be verified and someone would eventually figure out if she was correct and complete later. For now, it was important that she simply enjoy being a requirement, even if she wasn't sure who she was, what she was supposed to do, how well she was supposed to do it, or when she was supposed to do it. So she just ignored the whole subject. Being verifiable was okay for Shalos, but it wasn't for her, for Shalby. So what can we learn from shall be and shall is? If we're going to improve requirements quality, the first thing we must do is to identify the elements of the requirement based on who, what, how well, and under what conditions. We can use the NCOSI guide to writing <coughs> requirements, which has the subject and other clauses as defined in the guide and ISO 29148. What is important is to clearly parse and identify the elements of a requirement by requirement type or template. And here we display the elements of a requirement according to a set of Boeing requirement templates. For example, structured requirements for a functional performance type provide a target for the <coughs> architecture elements. The subject or agent addresses who, this is the name of the system or entity, the system of interest, which will satisfy the requirement. The function or behavior and output together address the what. These define the observable behavior of the system of interest. The timing and other performance attributes of the function address how well the function or behavior must be performed, including uh, how fast for an initiated condition. The input and condition address when the function is supposed to be performed 
and conditions may also include operational states and natural or induced environments. This detailed structure is not directly supported by SysML, which has a monolithic requirement statement and associated diagram. In order to parse a requirement, an additional mechanism must be added to an MDSC tool for rendering the individual requirement elements and the resulting completed statement. The Boeing implementation in DOORS concatenates the individual elements of a requirement into the complete requirement statement based on the template of the specific type. In the implementation, the engineer can only modify the requirement by altering an element of the, of the requirement. The, st uh, the structure or template cannot be modified and it's the responsibility of the requirement engineer to ensure that the resulting requirement is grammatically and technically correct. There are, of course, other types of requirements, such as design requirements, which include the design constraint and optional performance and conditions, environments, which include the characteristic, condition, exposure type, and optional exposure duration, and suitability, which includes the characteristic, required performance and condition, and optional condition duration. Each of these structures is different and the elements may not all be instantiated in the architecture, but for the functional performance type, all the elements are available in the model. So why are we using this information? Part of the reason is the emphasis on requirements management. That is traceability and configuration of the require configuration management of the requirement rather than requirements development. We've often been deriving at requirements by simply changing the agent name. And because of this practice, systems engineering and project managers may not see the value of architecture and analysis because the architecture does not drive the requirements. So they don't budget for the effort. We end up deriving next lower level shells based solely on the parent requirement. What we should be doing is developing the architecture at the next lower level and then derive and validate the requirements based on that information. The traceability from the parent requirement is then by the architecture as well as directly from the parent requirement. One can use the graphic representation of the model to populate the requirement, and this is an example using CORE from Vitec. We first display the requirement diagram using customized icon templates. The function template is customized to display the elements that appear on the EFFBD or activity diagram and other attributes of the function. The function, which is the what, the action of the component, interfaces, both inputs, the data which trigger the action, and outputs, the data which confirm the observability of the action, performance attributes, which provide the measures of success for the action, the how well, in this case, timing, accuracy, and reliability, and finally, the allocation to the correct component, the who. The requirement template displays the resulting requirement text and type, and we can see how each element is placed. In this example, we are still reliant on the requirement engineer to manually use the architecture elements to populate the requirement template. This manual transcription enables the requirements engineer to refine the functional descriptions to ensure verifiability. In this case, determine user is rendered as query the database in the functional description and transmit user information in the resulting requirement. Similarly, the output the transaction content is rendered specifically in the requirement as user information and it might be different for other requirements if we're reusing transaction content as an output from multiple functions. In a fully automated rendering, the requirements engineer would examine the resulting requirement text and perhaps update the function title, description, and other fields to ensure both a verifiable requirement statement as well as a coherent architecture model. And this is a good thing because it continues the process of evaluating and updating the analysis and requirements prior to finalization. But the model is driving the requirements. 
And in my graduate class, I use this diagram to help determine if students are actually using the model to populate requirements or are otherwise just engaging in creative writing of the requirements. And though automatic concatenation of the requirement elements is a feature of the Boeing customization of doors described earlier, the requirement element data in doors are not directly tied to the architecture. And a goal for SysML and MDSE tools would be to standardize the requirement elements and derive them from the architecture <coughs> data within the architecture model so that this construct could be automatically generated. What else can we do with the architecture model? We can simulate the architecture to validate the model and the resulting requirements for logic, timing, connectivity, input-output exchanges, and parametric performance related to functionality and throughput on defined interfaces, depending on the capabilities of the architecting tool. We don't simulate the requirements themselves, rather we simulate the architecture behind the requirements. Eventually, we might dispense with requirements altogether, but it might then become necessary, as Shakespeare says, to quote, kill all the lawyers because of their preference for textual requirements. And I'm not advocating violence here, so don't take that too literally. The architecture model enables us to validate the requirements resulting therefrom because we can check for verifiability using the template and criteria. Are all the elements of the requirement present and adequate? Check for sufficiency using the simulation of timing, performance, information exchanges, and interface connectivity. If the requirement is implemented as stated, will it ensure that the system satisfies the parent requirement and need? Check for necessity by ensuring proper derivation from a parent function. Is the parent requirement or need be satisfied without this requirement? And when in doubt, we can simply delete the function or alter the performance attributes in the model and assess the model performance. And in some cases, we can compare requirements on the components with the solution characteristics to establish feasibility. Okay, there we go. Establish feasibility for performance, sizing, reliability, and other parameters defined in the model. Can we obtain a solution that satisfies this and all other requirements within the program's constraints and with acceptable risk? We must be able to answer these questions to ensure validation of the requirements and the architecture model can help. Finally, we can evaluate the quality of the requirements by measuring the elements of the requirement in the model, checking for both existence of the element and the quality of the element content compared with defined criteria. For example, Functions must be observable at the system boundary in order to be a valid functional requirement at that architecture level. Hence, the Boeing template includes an output as an explicit part of the construct. We apply such criteria to each individual element of the particular requirement type in order to measure the requirements quality. And when we use templates and associated measurements, we can realize cost and efficiency improvements and minimize future rework. In this example graphic, the gold bars are the original scores and the green bars are the final scores of the requirements after <coughs> updating them in response to the initial scores. On the left is the requirement quality score from zero to four, and on the right is the percent cost avoidance based on that update. Significant improvement is observed after scoring and fixing the requirements. In other words, we used measurement as a feedback mechanism for improving the execution of the process and the quality of the product, work products. And just imagine how much effort might be saved if the requirements were correct and complete when they are first written. So what about shall be and shall is? Shall is lived happily ever after. She was implemented and verified. She had a very quiet life because she was complete from the beginning, because she was developed using the architecture model. In contrast, Shelby had a very volatile life. <laughs> she became almost unrecognizable after many changes during implementation as she finally figured out who she was, what she was supposed to do, 
how well she was supposed to do it, and when she was supposed to do it. Eventually, she was verified, but at a very old age. <laughs> the bottom line is, we need to use the information available in the MBSE architecture model to develop and write verifiable requirements, and I urge you to make it so. Thank you very much.